Last session, uh, we uh, began the start of what I called the 21 truths about competing biblically. And we did love as a cornerstone and powers manifested when individuals died of themselves for the team's sake. Number three in this sequence is the team over the individual. In, over the individual. We've talked about that at length, so I'm really not going to spend any time on that. We've used a couple quotes from John Wooden, and we also used the uh, Bible verse, and we talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer in that regard, power manifested when individuals die and the team over the individual. This is all, you know, it all overlaps uh, because it's, it's about uh, submitting ourselves for the good of the whole, the greater good, those kinds of things. Number four is humility is the mark of greatness. This is really a, a big, big, big deal. Uh, I, I think at the macro level for a Jesus follower, this is true that, uh, you know, your teachability, my teachability to Holy Spirit, let alone the body of Christ at the horizontal level, we talk about the vertical be, being uh, our relation with God pray, through prayer and the Word of God, and the horizontal being our relation with man, and that on that horizontal bar, you know, one side is evangelism, that's unbelievers, the other side is discipleship, that's believers, there's only two kinds of people, believers and under, unbelievers in the whole world. And, uh, and how discipleship and evangelism and the Great Commission lifestyle fits in to that, what we call the fellowship wheel, fellowship with God and fellowship with man, and making sure those spokes stay even, that the Word of God and prayer are, are, are balanced in terms of we are committed to them both, and at some level, uh, not that it is exactly equal time and commitment, but there our spokes are are growing with maturity uh, evenly, and the same is that the evangelism, that we have relationships with unbelievers and believers, and that we're nurturing them, praying about them, and acting upon them in, in the evangelism piece uh, and in the discipleship piece, both discipling others and being discipled, and that, that kind of thing. So the, all of this is integrated. We've talked about that, the school of sports ministry and the school of discipleship and evangelism. This all feeds together, our vertical relationship and our horizontal, the vertical driving the horizontal, shall we say, and so humility uh, drives us being lifelong learners. I can remember Dr. Coleman, uh, um, author of Master Plan of Evangelism, uh, my personal mentor in all things discipleship, just saying one time with passion, even though he was in his late 80s at the time, saying, Scotty, there's so much to learn, and, and the more I learn, the less I realize I know, and he wasn't just saying that. Uh, as a nice spiritual statement, uh, that is who he is. And when I think of Dr. Coleman, I think of someone uh, like Billy Graham. Of course, they were partnering in the evangelistic and discipleship efforts for decades. But I think about two men that are notorious for having deep, deep-seated humility. That humility was at the core of who they were. And coincidentally, their impact has been transformational to, to millions uh, throughout the world for decades and continues to be, though Billy Graham uh, has now gone to be with the Lord. And so this humility we talk about, we've, we've spoken about humility has to partner at some point with conviction, that you, you have to have humility and conviction together, that our strength is in the Lord and not ourself. Our competence comes from Christ, Paul says in Corinthians. And in our, in our seeking wisdom, and knowledge to service our flocks, our teams that are under our care, the people that are under our care in our communities, whether we're tied to a local, uh, through being on staff at a local church or whether we're lay people. You know, this is all permeating. This is about servant leadership. It's about dying to yourself. It's about uh, giving your life away and, and understanding that uh, receiving comes uh, as a byproduct of giving your life away. All those principles about being teachable. We, we use an acronym called FAT-C when talking about people that are, uh, that are uh, valuable to be invested in because they will reproduce and multiply. Faithful, available, teachable, courageous. These are traits we talk about in the School of Discipleship. They're true for coaches. They're true for players. They're true for anybody. We as coaches know what it's like when we have a player who's teachable versus one who's not. And that in teachability, which is usually linked with pride, is always going to squash the Spirit of God. And pride and rebellion travel together. 
And humility travels with the fruit of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. And uh, when pride itches into stuff, inches into stuff, uh, ourselves, our souls, then we end up, it, it, it can be smelled by others. We generally don't see it. Others can see it before we see it, which is problematic because we might feel like we're humble, but they see something different, which hinders our inner relationships. It is problematic at all levels. And so to, to pursue humility, to ask for it, to desire it, we humble ourselves. that's an act of our will, and God humbles us. Uh, this is both are desired. I mean, I'd prefer to humble myself before God has to humble me because I can't see it. But he's very, very good about finishing the job with each of us. And his, dire, his desire is for humility or what we call teachability. Coaches want players that are teachable. Uh, Players, frankly, want coaches who are teachable and humble. Uh, and uh, parents are looking for children to be humble. And children are looking for parents to be willing to say, please forgive me, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Uh, this, this just greases the engine. You know, we got gas in the engine, but we also need oil, the oil of the Holy Spirit, to, to make the parts be able to run smoothly. Without oil, an engine breaks down. Without gasoline, it doesn't run. They're all needed. They're all necessary. Uh, being faithful, available, teachable, and courageous all partner together to create somebody who then is a, 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 a valuable uh, servant in the kingdom. And so humility is the mark of greatness is our way of saying that that teachability, that humility has to be there vertically and horizontally for the engine of God to run in us and through us. A Bible verse, anyone who thinks he is something when he is nothing is deceived. Uh, if you did a doctrinal study on humility, on the word humble or humbly or all kinds of forms of the word humility or humble, uh, you, would have a, you would have a vast uh, quantity of verses to pool to show the significance of it. And Moses being a humble man of God, God's friend because of his humility, the most humble man in the earth at the time. That, that kind of thing has from the beginning been part of the call of God for man and, and mankind, men and women. And so we, we tried to model that. Now we're into that concept in discipleship. We say, I do it, I do it, you watch, you do it, I watch. Humility works that way. I'm, I'm, I walk in humility. You watch me walk in humility. I watch you walk in humility. And you then walk in humility, reproduce and multiply. Those principles are all to be taught, spoken, modeled, etc. Fifth, servant leadership. We just are talking about that. Servant leadership. The world uh, does uh, lordship. That's from top down, pressure. Servant leader leadership is bottom up. When we talk about accountability, accountability is not telling people what what they should do. It's giving people the right to ask you questions about who we want to be. They're two entirely different models. Both fall under the category of accountability. I'm going to hold you accountable to make sure you read, make sure you pray, make sure you're this. Versus how can I serve you? How are you doing in your service to others? Um, how are you doing in uh, issues of humility or fundamentals, Bible reading or prayer? How's ministry going? How are you doing in areas you struggle with? This is the kind of accountability that comes from a heart of humility, from the Spirit of God, uh, versus from the world's way, which is dictatorial, top-down. I'm going to hold you accountable. And so this servant leadership, uh, Jesus modeled it. You know, He did it. We watched Him do it. He watches us do it. We do it. Servant leadership. Jesus came to serve and not to be served, to give His life as a ransom for many. He gave. He gave and gave and keeps giving. This is, this is Jesus. And he asked us to go and do likewise. And he gave the, the, us the word and the power to do so. Prioritize developing servant warriors. Prioritize ourselves being servant warriors, servant leaders. Uh, servant warriors was a term that Frosty for me coined. He called them servant warriors. They, they weren't captains, those who were in charge of everybody. They were there to lead to lead by servant, the service. This is a, a trait even in the world that's acknowledged as being a powerful tool uh, within the business world or in relationships. Who wouldn't want to work for somebody 
whose heart is their best. I remember a boss I had, my best friend from college, I ended up working for. He was in an insurance agency. And my comment was, he cared about my needs and desires more than I cared about them. Now, whether he did or didn't, I had the feeling and the sense that he did. Well, that was incredibly motivating. I was, I was compelled to serve him because he led the way in serving me. Even though he was my boss, he served me and wanted my best, which motivated then for me to uh, serve him, work for him, etc. That's how it works with God. You know, Paul said, I'm compelled, I'm compelled. Uh, there's, there's, I'm pro- propelled by the Spirit of God within me to follow him and live for him and die for him and die to myself for the service of others, for the sake of the kingdom. This, is the, this thread runs throughout all of Christianity. Uh, another point on the servant leadership. Leaders lead the way by going first and going further. Maximal sacrifice. You see that in the military. I, I talked with them a class on discipleship last quarter about a particular uh, series I saw. I think it was on Netflix or Prime Video called Medal of Honor, which retraced the lives of Medal of, of Honor winners in our uh, United States military over the years, many of whom had died in their service for what they were given the Medal of Honor for, some who had lived. Some were from previous uh, wars, some were from current wars that we're in. This is not a comment about the viability or validity of war. This is just to say, as an example, what fascinated me as I watched those clips on these men is they'd made a predetermination that they knew they were going to die, and they were good with that. And so they led into battle, into overwhelming odds. I remember this one guy ran into machine gun fire without any real cover or protection. And he, he ran and was in, uh, shot and multiple times and got up and kept going and got up and kept going. And his perseverance motivated his squad to follow him. They were compelled to follow him, though they thought he was insane it would have been against it would have been unconsciousable for them to stay back in safety when their leader was running into the bullets and so they ran also and he led the way and captured the machine gun nests multiple ones of them and then after they had stabilized that situation they heard more machine gun fire and he immediately got up and ran in again into the other one he could have built his nest right there and they could have taken that beachhead and they could have moved from that place and stayed and held their ground and just fought but he went to take ground. That's, that's, that's a kingdom principle. Take ground. You see that in the Old Testament. Moses said, take the land. God has given you the victory. It's already finished. Take ground. That's what he says to us about eternity. I've finished my finished work on the cross. Take ground. I've given you all the land. Every, every place you've set your foot is yours. Now you go fight. Well, it's not ours like it, he fought the battle and we don't have to do anything. Sometimes that happened in the scripture. But generally, when he said, I've given you the victory, he meant now you do your part. I've done my part. Now you do your part. We do the actually fighting his hands and feet. He's the one who has declared and given the victory. But we have a part in that. We have a responsibility in that. And within that, people get shot and people do die. But it's all part of the greater good. And when everybody does their part, some live, some die. Some live in caves and holes in the ground. Some are sawed in two. Some are heads chopped off. That's true even to this day, right now, in 2019. And others are kings and those in authority. You do your part. Uh, it's like with John, when, when John was, uh, Peter and John in the last chapter, I believe, believe in the book of John, when uh, uh, Jesus was telling Peter the cost that he was going to have to face. And Peter said, what about John? And he said, I'm not talking to John, I'm talking to you. This is your price. He'll do his job. You do your job. Well, fundamentally, all of our fundamentally all of our jobs, if we're going to be biblically obedient, are going to be to lead by service, to be servant leaders. That humility would mark us. 